You're listening to the Aesthetically Speaking Podcast, presented by Next Tech. Welcome back to the Aesthetically Speaking Podcast, presented by Next Tech. I'm Robin Into, and today we have a special guest, Dr. Patrick Basil. Excited to have you here today. I know that Thank there's you. so much going on with respect to the industry, but before we get started there, let's just tell the audience a little bit about who, who you are and how long you've been in practice. Sure. Well, we can go way back, but really, I did my training at the University of Rochester, and when I was done there, I went to, to become an active duty plastic surgeon with the U.S. Navy because I had a military mm-hmm. commitment, and that was really amazing because... I had to be exposed to so many different injury patterns from the war. After doing that, we ended up settling in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And after being with a group for a small period of time, we started our own practice and kind of just hung a shingle and really (laughs) built from the ground up, which everybody said was a bad idea. And we just didn't listen, but certainly took some bumps, but we're really happy with what we've done and what we've learned. I've had the unique perspective of also getting to know your practice over the last several years and seeing you move into a larger space and really expanding in that area. And I think that there's, it's just so, congratulations is what I should say, because it's just been a journey that I've seen you go through and I've watched your practice grow and you've been very successful at not just building a very patient centric practice, but a culture within that I noticed to be just so well deserving of what you should get when, with respect to the type of team that you've built. And that's impressive because you just don't see that always. So it's, it's you know, kudos to you and, well, and thank to you. your yeah. team. I think, again, when you enter it with a little bit of naivety and you mm-hmm. don't really, obviously you have expectations to be successful, but when you don't really know what you're actually getting into right. and doing it. But I think from the very beginning, we wanted to have a sort of patient-centered boutique practice that only almost felt like a family practice. Right but within a surgical subspecialty and wellness center. And again, just hiring people that believed in that Mm -hmm. and really, you know, every day wanted to bring it. And I tell them all the time, I'm like, don't do what we do to try to please me, but it's where we're trying to serve the patient and do it absolutely best. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know we've got a lot to talk about today, but I think I was impressed with one of the things that you did is that you really focused on getting to a four day work week for you. Because you knew for yeah. your own self-sustaining, you know, component of being a great surgeon, but also having that work-life balance is what you needed. But you did it with a finesse that I don't always see in practices because they just don't understand efficiencies that they really need when they start to think about how do I consolidate? How do I still provide the best experience? How do I grow my practice? But still, how do I actually have a life outside of my practice? Yeah, it it, it took a little bit of creativity, but... In the end, when we looked about how we were going to do it, it made total sense. And now having that day, that extra day to do things for me, or yeah. but also for our practice from on a business side, mm-hmm. as opposed to just grinding away with seeing patients and operating, that alone has helped us to be more efficient and more successful. And also, you know, having a, just a little bit of a change of pace in a very robust surgical practice from a physical standpoint, allowed me to rest an extra day. And Mm so on those four days where I'm either in the operating room or in the office, I can really be 110%. Well, yeah. And you also did a great job of really focusing how your staff drive those efficiencies. So they they, they do a lot of pre-qualification of the patients, which you don't see that always. And I, I admire the fact that they really did do a great job of thinking about I want the right patients in here. So we're spending the right time with them. We're not wasting the patient time or prospect time. But at the same time, we're looking at building, you know, a a team that focuses on that appointment being very intentional. Yeah. Well, it starts again with, again, that Mm patient-centered experience. From the time they walk in, you want them to feel cared for, not that their time is being wasted, that their time is valued and that they're going to get the FaceTime with me that they deserve. Uh, right. So we get a lot of good feedback about that. But yeah, I mean, pre-qualification is very important. I work very hard with our patient care coordinator. And honestly, the majority of the new patients we see actually have already had or signed up for surgery yeah. months from now. Yeah. So it makes my job a little easier, but it allows us to just spend that time to you know really figure out what we're going to do. So you know, from an educational standpoint, we use social media. I, again, I always say it's not to sell, it's to educate, because mm-hmm. if you educate, you'll sell. And so the education component of what we do and having those resources, 
for patients to to learn so much before we really get them in there yeah. makes the consultation process very seamless. Yeah, you you actually though have built a workflow that you've invested the time in so that as we went into the economic shift as yeah. we're seeing right now and a lot of practices are talking about being slow and they don't have the bookings and people are canceling surgery you've actually almost built into that and didn't really focus just on low hanging fruit you really continued to focus on what was best for the patient and cultivated their experience such that now when we're looking at this slowdown that a lot of people are talking about it's a big buzz here at the show mm-hmm. we're seeing that that's not necessarily something within your practice because you've invested in how you actually communicate, how you lean into building that relationship before they ever come in, and then how you cultivate that experience, which is kudos to you. Don't see that always these days. Yeah, you know, I think it was very important, uh, you know, from the very beginning that we knew to grow the practice the way we wanted to. It was slow and steady was going to win the race. Totally, yes. And it was, again, if every patient has an exemplary experience, where are they going to do? They're going to talk yeah. about it. And there is nothing more powerful than a patient-to-patient recommendation because right. it takes all the uncertainty out of it. Yeah. So having that is a, you know, and again, that patient experience is a, a huge thing for us. And it, it builds confidence early, allows us to provide that experience. And yeah, I mean, I think, again, just having that algorithm of how we do it, you know, right. ha- has allowed us to kind of weather this slowdown, whatever mm-hmm. it is, yeah, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, again, speaking with other surgeons, I think there is some trends. Right. And so, but yeah, I think overall we've done well with that. No, I, you know, I love talking about your practice, sure. but I'd like to talk a little bit about what's really, let's, let's go back to the industry. So sure. the industry report came out. I know that there's other, you know, podcasting that's been done mm-hmm. on this, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, let's just like Briefly talk about like the top five cosmetic procedures. Sure. You know, I, I know that there's always a race for which procedure is going to be number one, but liposuction was at the top of the charts here. Kind of go back and forth between that and breast dog. Yes. Why do you think liposuction was the winner this past year? Well, I think, you know, people are taking health and how they look a lot more seriously. And we'll, we'll dive into that a little more later on. But right. I think as people are also losing weight for any type of reasons, there are those stubborn areas that just don't go away, right? So everybody, when they lose weight, uh, you know, this, we all know those fat cells shrink down, right? Mm-hmm. They don't, you don't lose them. They just shrink down. And there are definitely areas of the body that don't respond. Right. And so now it's like, I feel good. I feel healthy. I lost all this weight. I mm-hmm. dropped, you know, dress sizes, but I still have those areas around my waistline or, you know, in the submental area and and diet and exercise and medications aren't going to get rid of that. So that's why I think we're seeing. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's a lot around weight loss, as we know, with all the weight loss drugs. So it makes sense that that would actually kind of, you know, propel that up to number one. But, you know, I mean, if you think about it, the other body procedures here... We only really see eyelids, one facial plastic procedure in the top five. Any thoughts on why? For a facial? Just from the, yeah. Again, I think building on the trend of weight loss, I think, we, and, and also with younger people, I think what's happening is the changes in the face may not be as robust as in the rest of the body. Right. And so when you have, and this is different than an older population, right? Mm-hmm. If you have an older population who's losing weight, I think you see it more in the face. Like we've all heard of that Ozempic face, right? Yes. And so, yeah, I think that's probably what it is where, you know, when people lose a bunch of weight and they're younger, I think the face can handle it a little better. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it makes sense. It doesn't seem too surprising though. When I think about it, do you see any surprises when you think about the top five in the procedures? No. So liposuction breast dog, that's always going to be up there. Tummy tuck breast lift, again, going along with weight loss and eyelid surgery. No, I think those are kind of, I think what we see over the years is those top five kind of change spots, right? Yeah. You know, one year it might be breast dog. And so I think what we're going to see in the next few years is definitely, I would say, more body contouring mm. than necessarily augmentation, you know, making things bigger. You know, I yeah. think I think that that trend is sort of changing, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the call outs was the ballet body. Yes. Oh, let's talk about that a little bit. That's a yeah. unique term. Yep. And I had not heard it before. I hadn't even heard it spoken at all in this industry. 
first time I saw it was in the industry reports. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so the ballet body, if whoever's listening isn't familiar with it, it's really kind of trying to create balance, right? With dancing and with ballet, you think of balance, you think of nice lines, you think of mm. symmetry, you think of flow, right? So all those things with ballet, we're extrapolating them, applying them to kind of body contouring. So instead of people seeking out which traditionally in the past, they might have wanted to make their gluteal area much bigger, right? Or their breasts much bigger or things like that. The trend now is balance and people want those, those lines. And it, and it has to do with, it's multifactorial, right? Because obviously people are taking their health a lot more seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, along with the weight loss drugs, surgery, people just losing weight because, and those areas that are just lingering that need some toning or, or tightening, you're going to see just again trying to create that balance and symmetry. As a, And also the other thing is when you look from a functional standpoint, right, too, I have so many patients in our area, we, we're in Northeast Florida, that are, are very active, right? Mm-hmm. And they like, they want to do their ballet, their yoga, their Pilates, their, their working out, their CrossFit. And, you know, I think we all know that you can't really put a giant breast implant in there and expect everything to be easy, right? Yeah. Running isn't easy when you have heavy implants. So uh, uh. if you have someone who, you know, is very toned or whatever and doesn't have, you know, much size to their chest, we're seeing a trend towards smaller implants. Yeah. And, you know, that goes along with this ballet body. Again, create balance, right? We're trying to match the lower part of the body with the upper part of the body in a nice form. So I think... Again, we're going to continue to see that trend. So not necessarily people are looking for huge emphasis or overemphasis. We're going back to, as you said, a natural looking appearance. Yeah. I think it's like you said, natural, but the word you said that made sense was flow. Yes. Yeah, so, and also when you think about it, let's dive a little deeper. Plastic surgery comes from the word plasticos, which is to shape or remodel. Mm. And I always tell patients, you know, what we do in our specialty is restore form and function. So when you have a cohort of patients that have lost weight, and again, some might have skin that's like hanging, some might have fat that's not responding, to create that nice flow, to restore that flow, that nice form and function, or even people that didn't have that to begin with, that's what the trends are sh- are showing is that people have a more interest in that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it seems like it just kind of goes in line with everything we're even seeing with the non-surgical side of things. Absolutely. And I, mean, I think that you're going to have those areas of the country where, you know, it's still not as hot. Like people are, you know, still like bigger breasts, right. bigger yeah. bombs and, and stuff like that. It's to be expected. But again, going along with that, kind of ozempic face mm. you know I, I hate to use that word <laughs> but but, it, <laughs> but it's there well we all we all hear we all know right. what it is um mm-hmm. is going to be again to restore form and function of the face right if someone's lost a bunch of weight and all the fat in their mid face is gone we're not trying to make them look fake we're trying to make them look balanced take those thirds of the face and balance out a chin a mid face and a forehead so that they can look as back to normal as possible yeah that makes more sense And I think that we're also seeing the whole generational impact. So you've got the younger generation that's really thinking about contouring to gain that ballet type of body, whether it's, you know, adding implants or reducing their breast size. And we're seeing that younger patient. In your practice, where do you, have you, are you seeing an uh, an uptick in that as well? Oh, definitely. And I, and I think that's why it's not surprising for me to see uh, breast lift on there or breast, even Mm -hmm. breast reduction with younger patients, it, and it's because I think they're learning or they've talked to older people and they've said like, hey, don't wait. If you have large breasts that inhibit you from wearing what you want to wear or mm-hmm. doing what you want to do, then you can. there's something you can do. And it's becoming a lot more talked about and accepted in younger patients to have, you know, otherwise they wouldn't have scars on their breasts. But now yeah. it's just like, no, it's more important for me to be able to wear the clothes I want to, to look proportional, to be able to run without having to wear two or three sports bras, all those things I think kind of go along with that of, of people kind of wanting to look very balanced. I mean... Yeah, you know, I also think about 
not to go down a rabbit hole, but you think about the younger generation and the bullying and this, the presence on social media, and you're always front and center, or you're trying to be accepted. And so this is, I think, just going to extend itself as we see into the plastic surgery market, because again, like you said, it's more acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. To, and, and it's allowed. It's it's permitted these days. It is. And again, but what I think I, we've seen or, or some of the things I've noticed is that, especially on social media, that sort of shock value of what people were doing, maybe really inflated lips, a lot of filler <laughs> in the face, big breasts, the big BBLs we've all seen. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of emphasis on that. I see that changing, you know, yeah. at least on good social media. That's not there for shock value. You're still going to have that. And there are some people that still like to see that stuff of like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? But, you know, I think a lot of what we're seeing, again, is just going back to people want to look, quote, unquote, normal and balanced. Yeah. Which for me and the specialty, I absolutely love that, you know, because one of the things we'd always battle is like, you know, people get the stigma of plastic surgery with air quotes, right? It's just like because I think there was a misconception that someone who had plastic surgery was going to look fake. And yeah. and that's absolutely not the case. And so when we have the opportunity to do educational things, it really makes a big difference because people now, the barrier to entry is like, okay, I feel comfortable talking about it. And, you know, they, they talk to their friends who may have had it or have seen some of our before and afters and know like, oh, you can get this and actually look good and normal and not weird. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. It's it's just still, I go back to the word ballet body and you just think grace and elegance. And I think form is a really great way to describe it. Let's let's shift a little bit. Sure. And talk about that whole non-surgical arena. Yeah. yeah. Because I know that's a big part of this. I know we talked about, you know, it's all about natural. Like we're not going to make our lips three times our normal size. We want them to be natural and the proportion to yep. fit within the face. I mean, I, I worked with surgeons for years. The point is to not necessarily notice the nose. The nose should fit within the face so it isn't noticeable. And so I think that that's a lot about what we're trying to see and and what we see with practices that are starting to offer these services more. Where do you see the med spa market and this non-surgical arena? Just what what is your take on it? Well, I think, you know, we all know that COVID was a big, is big, is largely responsible for this because everybody was now on FaceTime or Zoom and looking at their face and talking more about it. There was a lot more social media involved and ask anybody, look around, how many med spas have popped up by you, right? So in in our town alone, it's incredible. And you know, it hasn't changed. The population hasn't changed that much. Good point. I think the demand has gone up a little bit, maybe not as linear as the amount of med spas opening. So I think Mm -hmm. if you talk to most med spas or practices that do a lot of non-surgical, they might tell you that their volume is down a little bit, but I think that's because it's it's diluted. But I mean, this is a $17 billion industry that employs over 100,000 people. So the industry in itself is growing. And I think people see this or people that want to get into the game see it as being lucrative. Now, that's the point where for, for physicians like myself, where we get a little, you know, uneasy because this isn't just something to make money on, you know, we, there's so much training involved in what we do. Mm. In fact, if, if an injector joins our practice, there are months before they're allowed to touch a patient and levels that they have to do of education, just learning about it, learning about anatomy, learning about all those things, because you can really harm someone yeah. with a lot of these things that med spas are doing. And then the other thing is, if you look at who's running these med spas, they're not people in the big four, right? Yeah. And, and which, that also drives me crazy because I always tell patients, you know, if you ever have anything done, make sure there's a medical director that could be able to fix it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, I, I mean, we all hear the stories, right? Someone wants to get in the game. They have a friend who's an ER doc or a family practice who has no background but just needs an MD or a DO. They raise capital either by themselves, take a loan out, or a bunch of people put money together and they jump right in. And what do they have to do? They have to start making money, right? So, yeah. so you have to start injecting fast. So I'm not sure the education levels there. So that's what worries me regarding that. But 
again, we are seeing the numbers go up, and it's something that's not going to stop. No, I mean, I think I was looking at the med spa report, and it was up by 10%. So the growth is there. More than surgery. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you've got, you know, all the different generations that are entering into this market. Non-surgical is fast. It leans into the other thing to note about this industry, which is budget conscious. And so people are thinking about what can I do that's going to give me the boost. Yeah. It's going to give me close to where I want to be, but maybe not necessarily where I ultimately want to be. And so non-surgical can do that. It can help with that contouring and redefining. But I also think that you know, at the end, of, at the end of this, it still goes back to the thing that you said. I want to talk about a little bit more is mm-hmm. the education. Yeah, and you do a heavy amount of it within your practice. When you think about educating your your coordinators or your staff or even the people doing the injections, yeah. you you do a, a fair amount of that. Let's talk a little bit more about what your expectation is from them, and then. You know, where does that transition over into what the patients understand? Because I think sure. that's a big loss yeah. is people don't understand the level of education of what should be. Yeah. And, and I think you brought up a great point is that if you don't educate all of your staff, who's answering the phones, right? Because that's the first touch with a patient, right? Right. And so that person has to be as educated as possible to at least have a good conversation about mm. what the patient might be asking. And, and start to build expectation. Now, if it gets more than that, we definitely kind of switch them to a provider or a patient care coordinator or something like that so they can get a little bit more in-depth. But you have to know what we do, first off, right? And, right. And, and, and kind of like, and the big thing is people talk about pricing. Do you talk about pricing over the phone? Do you not talk about pricing? Because again, you want to build expectation. You're not helping yourself if you fill your schedule up with people that have no idea how much this stuff costs and come in and they're like, they take a spot and then they're like, oh, I can't afford that, you know? Well, that so. people like to self-diagnose and they like to decide what yeah. they need, how much they need versus understanding where you think about full correction or you want to achieve yeah. X, well, you're not going to get there with just this. So. Yeah, and I think that's the other thing, you know, full correction, talking about treating a patient as a whole. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of the most important things we do when people come in is like we just, it's about education, right? So we make sure that we have enough time allotted to have that conversation so that we can have a treatment that's both going to fulfill expectations and have a good outcome. So uh, we follow a mantra, the right procedure on the right patient at the right time. And you have to follow that. Because if you do, you'll have success. Yeah. If you don't, like if you're just trying to like, and this is the other thing I think with some med spas, it's all about revenue or numbers, right? Mm. And they give their injectors levels that they have to hit, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're taking it from something that's more like a medical type thing Mm -hmm. to something that's like a commodity. And and, and it's like salesy. And so what happens? People might be not getting exactly what they need or or undertreated too. And then they might be unhappy because we certainly say no to patients where it's just like, oh, I just want you know, one unit of Botox here and here and that's it. Or I only want to do one filler for my whole face. It's like, you're probably not, you know, worth it. So let's go back to what you just said, because I've been thinking about this. No, telling the patient no. And I know that that's probably in a practice that's medical, Mm -hmm. especially a plastic surgery practice, you understand the concept of no. What do you think that that really equivalates to within the med spa space? Well, I think the one of the biggest things is is getting a good history on the patient. Yes. You know, and I, I don't think everybody does that. Mm-hmm. Again, sometimes it, people go to med spas and it's almost like going to a restaurant and ordering off a menu and like, mm-hmm. all right, I want 50 units of Botox, three syringes of filler. And then like the practitioner comes in, they have the list, it's already drawn up, they do this and they don't have that talk, right? So... Yeah, the ability to say no. And I think a, a lot of it does come with getting a history. Like, what have you had done? When have you had it done? Who does your normal injections? When's, you know, maybe this was like the fifth med spa or practice they've been to in the week because everybody else has said no. And, you know, yeah. someone's going to take their money. So I think it's important because, again, to identify risky patients. Uh, yes, and, for sure. And it's not, and it could be risky for medical reasons, like I know places that don't even ask what meds they're on, ah. you know, and 
you know, then they'll have all these hematomas and stuff because patients are on like blood thinners and it's just like, just ask, you know? And yeah. And then when you spend time having those conversations with the patients, other things can come to light that you may not even have understood about that patient that would be considered a risk because you didn't take the time to actually talk to them because everybody's rushing to get... We focus on volume. Yeah. I want you to see X number of patients in mm-hmm. a day. You need to push this number through so that you can hit this quota, so that you can hit this level. And when we do that, then we take away what is really... This is a medical procedure. Yeah. And that is what's being forgotten, I think. Yes, it's a med spa, but first and foremost, it's a medical spa, which means that you really need to be focused on, this is truly a medical treatment. Are we taking the time to actually assess and only treat based upon what should be done for that patient. Yes, and that and that means you have to have good protocols in place. Mm-hmm. You have to have leadership from the top. It should be from the medical director having a very strong presence there mm-hmm. or reviewing things with the providers with concerns they might have. But again, that comes with education of the providers as well. If they don't yeah. know, then they don't know what to ask. If they don't know, then they don't know what to look for. Well, you know, you're in Florida. So in Florida, you know, a med spa cannot allow an esthetician or a nurse to do any injections, even in a practice. So it has to be a PA or an NP or a physician. Sure. So we know that. But, you know, that's also a big problem because throughout the country, that's not the same in every country. There's different regulations around that. There's states that allow estheticians to inject. Albeit, that's not where we're here to kind of judge or understand. But what I do think is interesting is that you know, I'm in Georgia mm-hmm. and nurses can inject. But what most people don't understand about that is that while a nurse can inject, they first have to have clearance by a physician or a PA or an NP that has actually done a history on that patient sure. or a good faith exam is what they might be calling it. But having that true understanding, their, their history has been reviewed. We know that they're a candidate and we think that they've got from our assessment, yeah. we can go forward. And standing orders are not going to be acceptable. That is overlooked a lot of times in practices. Now, that would yeah. be helpful if that was understood and also adhered to, because I think that that gives us a level up as far as making sure we're first and foremost looking at the patient and taking care of them, but treating them as a patient. Yeah, I think from a safety standpoint, that's great. Cause, right. Because it's really going to make sure that boxes that need to be checked are going unchecked, mm-hmm. things are going to fall through the cracks or the right questions aren't going to be asked. So from a sta- from a safety standpoint, I think it's awesome. You just have to look from a practitioner standpoint, are injectors merely technicians or are they true facial artists who have an understanding of the anatomy, you know? So let's circle all the way back to yeah. where we started, which is, you know, the ballet body. You could almost call it the, you know, the, the, the ballet body is yeah. the the head to toe. Okay. So injectables are generally in the face and it goes back to, do they understand the art of what they should be doing and achieving? And are they, are they providing balance? Well, if you take the time to Mm -hmm. educate like that, yeah, then absolutely they do. For sure. And this might be a change for some patients who've been treated somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's more of like, again, pulling through a drive-thru and being like, I know what I want. I know what I get. I get a syringe in each cheek and 50 units across the floor, you know? And they're like, you know, it's a different experience sometimes with our practice where patients are like, wow, no one's ever really talked to me about that and, and, and really take the time to do the why, you know? Well, they don't educate. Yeah. And I think that that's a big miss. We don't take the time to educate. And so people have assumptions that this is normal, and then that's where the risk comes into play. Well, it's risk and also, let's look at it from a business standpoint. Yeah. If you take the time to educate somebody and they have a better understanding of what you're trying to do and how you're going to do that, I think they're much more likely to invest more Mm. in their treatment. Right. Because it takes it to a, a different level. It takes it from that drive-through to almost being at like a Michelin-rated restaurant. They come in and they have the experience of, let's tell you what's on the menu today. Let's talk about that. Let's, you know. We think about patient experience, but one of the things that we don't tend to include in our entourage or list of things for patient experience is education. Yeah. Because it, it takes time. 
and people don't always remember everything, but it's a component to take into consideration because to your point, it provides you a patient that's a happier patient because they're educated and probably a more loyal patient. Even if they spend more or invest in more in your practice, it's probably loyalty that you'll have for life because they recognize that you're truly looking out for their best interest. Absolutely. And again, going back to where we started, which is where we've seen success in our practice, not just in surgery, but in non-surgical side is providing that experience of education. Right. Yeah. And then they talk about it. And, and so when you talk about being able to, to weather changes in the economy mm-hmm. or, or things like that, if there's a fixed number of people who are going to be seeking something and you're the place to go, you're still, you're going to be the busy, place to, busy go. the place to go. Yeah. And so that's the goal. But overall, I mean, from the very beginning, and I think this might be very different than some of the med spas, is my goal wasn't to make the most amount of money possible. My okay. goal was to provide the best experience possible. And that may have meant that it took a while for us to get where we needed to be mm-hmm. from a financial revenue standpoint. But that, putting those roots down, will not only help you grow incredibly long-term, but it'll help you weather those changes in the economy because then you will be the place to go. You know, I think that you've said it so well. And again, kudos to you and what you've done with your practice and how you've invested in that patient experience. And I think that oh, that's well, going to win all day long, every day. Yep. I appreciate you being on the show today. And I well, think this has been a great episode for us. Thank and you for having us. I w- welcome you back anytime. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Aesthetically Speaking, the podcast where beauty meets business, presented by Next Tech. Follow and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Links to the resources mentioned on this podcast are available in your show notes. For more information about Next Tech, visit nexttech.com. Or to learn more about TouchMD, go to touchmd.com. Aesthetically Speaking is a production of The Axis. T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.